Today, I'm going to talk about uh, brain-computer interfaces, the systems, and how they connect the brain to technology. So I have a lot of uh, cameras here. I'm going to just focus on this one, perhaps, yeah, or that one. Um, I would like to start by a definition of what brain-computer interfaces are. Um, these are systems that collect brain recording uh, from brain imaging uh, tools and use the signals in order to understand what the user is experiencing. That um, includes what the user intentions are, what their emotional status is, and whether they have a certain cognitive state such as fatigue or high attention level. Uh, we use these um, state classifications in order to make a connection between the human and technology. Some external machine that could be a computer or it could be a robotic uh, platform. Um, then again, one, once we have this connection between the human and the machine, there is also this feedback element that can happen actively when the user actually sees how their intentions have been um, sort of like translated into commands for machines, or the technology, the machine and the background is passively changing uh, based on the desires of the uh, human. So a, a typical example I give in this situation is a robot who would shut up and no longer ask questions if the user is tired, uh, which happens a lot with Pepper, right? He's all the time talking. Um, so, um, the image that most of people have from brain computer interfaces, um, what they get from media is this invasive um, systems that um, sort of translate a human motor intentions using brain implants. Um, so what we usually have with this system is that the person is connected to a sort of neural prosthetics or an exoskeleton. And then we use the um, surgically implanted electrodes in order to understand how the brain is um, sort of reacting whenever the user has an image or a, an intention of movement. Whereas in my research, I do not work with patients, I work with healthy users. And the idea is that to be able to record their brain activity non-invasively from the surface of the scalp. We call this technology, this method, electroencephalogram, in short EEG. And with the advancement of the hardware, nowadays we do have EEG headsets, EEG cap, that can look at the electrical activation while people are um, engaged in an activity um, very non-invasively. So there is uh, no intrusion to the user. And at the same time, um, there, there is a lot of improvement in the hardware to the uh, point that we can actually collect this uh, wirelessly. So you can wear these caps, these headsets, and walk around, and we will have access to your brain activity. Now, um, in my research, I have been using EEG in order to connect human brain to multiple technology forms. So in my PhD, being at Ishiguro, lab, I connected um, humans to um, these human-like robotic platforms and investigated the sense of embodiment and telepresence that they experienced. Then in my postdoc, I shifted toward more social robotics and tried to develop um, systems that could um, basically monitor brain activity of a user in a therapeutic setting with a social robot. Uh, right now, I'm focusing on two interesting projects that takes neuroscience tools in order to uh, measure human perception when they are engaging with digital humans. And also, I'm interested in learning. This is the project that I'm going to explain more today. And then I also have some projects uh, that just recently got kicked off or they're still waiting funding um, that are more focused on consumer psychology and elderly healthcare. Because I don't have time to talk about all these projects, I have selected neurofeedback and augmented learning, and I would like to walk you through um, the steps that we take in order to develop these systems. Before that, I would like to first start by uh, emphasizing how important this neurotechnology are to the learning. So why do we need to uh, look at brains, the brain activity, to measure a human learning, a user's uh, learning process? So what is currently happening with most of the educational technology is, is very similar to traditional education, where there is the learning phase and then there's the evaluation phase. So you interact with technology in form of a robot or maybe virtual reality environment, maybe even a computer um, uh, tutoring system. And then after that, we 
we ask the subject how they felt, what was their, their subjective workload. Uh, we give them a task and then collect their task performance or response time. And that's basically what happened. So we have no information about the learning process and the dynamic of the uh, learner's experience in that process. So what I suggest in this case, what well, many of the researchers in this uh, field suggest is the neurophysiological uh, measures that can actually give us an, um, an ambient tool that does not really um, interfere with the learning process, but at the same time can give us a way to understand uh, how the trainee is experiencing the training. And um, the cognitive theory behind this is one that uh, connects performance with cognitive workload. We know that in many um, training settings, um, there is a certain uh, level of cognitive workload that is called the optimal workload, in which the, the, the trainee shows the highest performance and highest learning gain. So if the workload is too much, they are going to feel anxiety, anxious, they are going to have a certain level of anxiety and distress. And if the workload is too low, they're going to get bored and they no longer can learn. So if we can maintain that um, optimal level of cognitive workload, we can actually make the performance efficient all the time during the learning phase. And that's what the idea of this project is. With that, I would like to uh, move to the project Masterminds, which I gave a little bit of introduction last time. It's a collaboration between uh, Royal Netherlands Air Force, Tilburg University and Mind Labs. And it um, aims to integrate neurotechnology and VR, virtual reality environments in aviation training. For those of you who were not here last week, the concept of this project is that Right now, most of the training is happening in Air Force. The aviation training is happening in either actual flying hours or in cockpit simulations. And cockpit simulations are very resourceful and expensive. And uh, particularly with Corona, we saw that suddenly, you know, you may lose your um, access point and um, basically the training is stops there. Whereas what Air Force wants to do, um, uh, it wants to um, use this new technology, such as virtual reality, to make the training more accessible. So the pilot can just be at home and connect to this VR simulation and be able to get training, um, even interact with their instructor in that um, simulation. And while they are wearing this VR headset anyway, the idea is that, okay, let's combine it with EEG electrodes to have a scanning of their brain activity to be able to monitor their workload so that we can make the training more efficient for them. So we have three research questions in this project. First, we would like to validate um, the VR simulation for this kind of training. We want to look at the effectiveness of the, the simulations and compare them to the traditional cockpit simulators. Um, second, we want to know what are the neuroindicators of long-term training, particularly aviation training is not something that can happen overnight. It takes um, a longitudinal training sessions and we want to know how the learning curve emerges for each pilot. And then after that, we want to have, to, we want to have this neurofeedback model that can adapt the training within that VR simulation for each pilot, for each user. And here is an outline of our working packages. So we have um, the part that we develop the system um, and then the part that we evaluate the pilot interacting with that system. So the, I think the most interesting part for the viewers today is the, um, the development part. So I want to tell a little bit about um, uh, that part. Um, so a little bit under the hood, what's happening. Uh, what we usually do with these experiences is that uh, we collect a lot of EEG data, and then we start processing them and using AI techniques with them. Um, we did a recent systematic review um, uh, using um, keywords such as EEG and learning, training, uh, particularly aviation in the context of aviation training. And what we found is that um, the reports are quite a mess. Um, so <laughs> learning happens everywhere in the brain. Um, and there are so many components that are reported um, in relation to learning, um, even in one context, that is the aviation uh, training. But one indicator that seemed to be a little bit more promising and had been used in the past in other contexts that uh, like um, context other than aviation training is the EEG engagement index. 
that uses spectral features such as beta band power, alpha band power, and theta band power in order to understand how much cognitive workload the user is experiencing. And the idea of these band powers is basically very easy if you are not familiar with them. It looks at how fast or slow the brain activity is. The faster, the higher um, uh, activation uh, you are experiencing, and perhaps the more involved and engaged you are in a task. And for our project, the first uh, step, the first experiments that uh, we are um, planning is to actually validate this in, um, indicator, EEG indicator, in two simulation settings. One of them is a virtual reality simulation that is provided to us by Air Force, and the other one is a desktop simulation. And uh, we're going to recruit um, subjects as soon as the labs are open after Corona. And uh, of course, um, together with EEG, we're going to have subjective measurements. We're going to have eye tracking, behavioral measures. So it's always about the relationship between these measures in order to ensure that the EEG indicator is actually uh, showing us what we want to find in the data. Now, I want to close this talk with some talk about BCI ethics. There is no talk about BCI in which I don't get questions about brain hacking. Um, um, certainly, um, ethics is an important issue in BCIs. Um, a recent review um, collected different categories of ethical issues regarding BCI technology. Um, in this, we have physical factors, such as how much safe the technology is, psychological factors, um, whether the technology is going to change sense of self and agency, and more importantly, the social factors. So I think the physical and psychological factors are uh, factors that have been already investigated a bit uh, with the patients, but the social factors require expertise from other fields, such as law, regulation, ethics. And um, to that end, I actually have the planning to um, write a proposal together with a law school student um, on the ethics of BCI and whether um, uh, there should be regulation about these uh, systems in order to make it accessible to everyone um, in order for human flourishing to happen. Thank you so much. Thank you.